Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the service here this morning at Altima Hall Baptist Church. Seems like every Sunday our crowd is growing just a little bit bigger. We know that there's a lot of people that are still at home that would love to be here with us, but we also know that there's a lot of people that are watching us by way of the Internet, and we're welcoming them as well. We continue to love to get the responses from all of you that are watching from the Internet, and, uh, and uh, we're glad that you're able to listen to us. And we encourage you to continue to do so. We want to be much in prayer for one another, and we'll have a special time of prayer coming up in just a few moments. But at this time, Brother Alvin has something that he'd like to share with the church at this time. We have someone who's going to have a birthday this coming week. I'm going to ask Josh if he might coming up here. Thank for what Josh is doing for his children and young people, him and Brittany. Y'all give him a hand. Let's sing, <laughs> let's sing happy birthday to Josh. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. All right. Amen. All right. All right. Praise the good Lord. Well, we're in for an exciting morning here at Altima Hall Baptist Church, and we're ready to get into that spirit of worship. I'm going to invite the singers to come this morning and share with us the song that they got on their heart, and then we'll have a time of prayer. So you folks come on up here and share with us the song this morning. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll 
Glory to God. I'll tell you the truth. I love that song, don't you? I'll be singing that song the rest of the day. That's that kind of song, isn't it? Yeah, amen. It's easy enough for me to sing, and uh, I love it. I thank the Bristos for bringing that with us, and they're going to come back in just a little bit and share with us another special. But I tell you, just put a little leap in our step this morning already, hasn't it? Boy, I tell you, if you hadn't felt the presence of God in your heart and in this place, then really and truly you need to deal with that situation immediately. You don't want to miss out what God has in store for you here this morning, and don't wait till the very end of the service itself to think, well, I think I'll try to get in touch with God. No, go ahead and get in touch with Him right now. He's got a very special message for us all here today. But let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we need to be much in prayer for one another. Certainly, we need to be praying for this nation, praying for the world, asking God to intervene and to straighten this mess out, and He's the one that can do it. And let's remember to pray for all that have been sick, and we've got quite a few that are sick. Not only are people battling this pandemic and so forth like that, but still there's people that are battling MS. And we want to remember Kelly, we want to remember Mary, we want to remember Tammy in prayer, Mike and Bonnie in prayer. We want to pray for Hilda and Johnny in prayer. We want to pray for Nancy Perkins in prayer. We want to continue to pray for Lorraine in prayer, Ruth. Carter in prayer, diagnosed with uh, cancer. We want to pray for Tim Hazlett battling cancer and just so many. The list just continues to go on and on and on. So there's a lot of things that are still going on other than all these other uh, new things that have just started up. So we want to be much in prayer for all those that are in law enforcement and uh, all those that re uh, first responders and Let's pray certainly for all those that are in the military as well. And the churches. Let's pray for all the churches because a lot of churches are being hit very hard, very hard throughout this time. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. All right. You ready? Let's pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we're thankful, dear Heavenly Father, for I'm looking forward to that time that, dear God, we'll just take off out of this old world. I am hope I'm in that generation, dear Heavenly Father, that will leave out of this place and meet you there in the air and go back with you up into heaven. But Lord, if I go by way of death, I'm glad I've got peace, dear Heavenly Father, knowing where I'm headed. And Lord, if there's anybody here today that is not assured of their salvation, I pray that today, dear Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit, dear God, will deal with not only the hearts of those that are here in the auditorium, but with those that are listening by the way of the internet. Lord, I also pray for those of us that are saved. Lord, I pray you'll touch our hearts, dear Heavenly Father, today. You know our needs, dear God. Lord, I pray that you'll just bring conviction upon our hearts about where we have failed you, sin in our life, dear God. We pray, God, for forgiveness. We're praying, God, for mercy, dear God, today, asking you to bless in a very special way. We're praying, dear Heavenly Father, for all those that are battling cancer, dear God. We remember Randy Webster's aunt and their family in prayer, dear Heavenly Father, concerning that. Praying for Tim Hazlip, dear Heavenly Father. We're praying for Ruth Carter, dear God. We're praying, dear God, for Lorraine. We're praying, God, for Johnny and Hilda, dear God. Nancy Perkins, dear Heavenly Father. Jim Hall got to come home, dear Heavenly Father, but we know they called in hospice, as you know, dear God. And we're praying for Jim, too, dear Heavenly Father. Ruth Carter, dear God. We want to remember all these folks in prayer. We want to pray, dear Heavenly Father, for your will to be done in this church and churches like this throughout the world. Praying for those that are in law and first enforcement and first responders, dear God. Praying for missionaries, dear Heavenly Father, throughout the world. Praying, dear Heavenly Father, for all those that are serving in the military too, dear God. And also, dear Heavenly Father, continue to bless us. God, you know the message that we need to hear. And God, I pray that you will uplift us, dear God, encourage us and strengthen us, correct us where we need it. And God, we want to praise you and give you all the honor and all the glory for these things we're asking in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, we got another wonderful song uh, to be shared with us today. So come on up and share it with us now, friend. And uh, God bless you today. Amen. Woo. Um, so my mom wanted me to talk a little bit about this one. Um, I'm going to be singing Reckless Love by Corey Ashbury, and um, not a lot of people really get what the song means, but um, when you hear it, it talks about leaving the 99, and, um, you know, when you first hear the song, you sort of blip right over it, but if you read it in the Bible, you see that it talks about um, the story which uh, 
Jesus told um, in back when he was alive, and he told about how um, a shepherd counted his sheep at the end of the day and realized that there was one left, and he left the 99 in danger just to find that one. spoke a word, you were singing all over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. And you have been so, so kind to me. deserve it still you give yourself away oh the overwhelming never-ending reckless love of god yeah When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. And you have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. And you have been so, so kind to me and all oh, the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God oh who chases me down fights till I'm found leaves the 99 and I couldn't earn it and I don't deserve it still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, yeah. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. And there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. And there's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. And there's 
snow wall, you won't kick down. Why you won't tear down? Coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. And oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. But still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, I certainly appreciate those songs this morning, and I'm glad that God loves us with an overwhelming, never-ending love, aren't you? We don't deserve it. I can't explain it, and I can't understand why he loves somebody like me especially, but I am so glad that he does. Amen. Well, if you will, please, this morning, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 142. Psalms 142, and I like to begin reading with verse number one. And I'm going to read the entire song this morning, all right? So if you will, please stand with me now, those that are able, as I read from the precious Word of God. The Bible starts out, and this is from David. David writes a lot of the Psalms that are in the Hebrew hymnal here. And David is writing this while he is in a cave. Now, why he is in this cave is because Saul, the king at that time, is trying to kill him. Saul is so upset with him. He's eat up with jealousy and envy. And Saul is diligently looking for David. And as soon as Saul can find David, he is going to kill David. So that's the kind of setting here that you need to understand what David is going through and all that is on him at this moment when he writes this song. So as I begin to read verse number one, it says, I cried unto the Lord. How long has it been since you really cried out to God? Now that word cried there literally means, I mean in a moment of desperation, it's almost like screeching out, you know, when you just to the point that you just got to shout, you can't just hold it in no longer. I mean, you were just, have you ever been there? Have you ever been to that point that you just, it just come out, I mean, it's a bull. Have you ever noticed how that the prayers in the Bible are all out loud? Have you ever noticed that? And this prayer particularly is one of those prayers where it's almost at the point of shouting. It's almost at the point of screaming it out. That's what desperation is. This was where David is at this time. Have you ever been there? How long has it literally been since you've had to cry unto the Lord with my voice? With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication? That means he's bringing before the Lord his request. But look at this next verse. How many times do we do this? In verse number two, it says, I poured out, out my complaint before him. How many of us spend more time complaining than we do praising? Do you ever come before the Lord and complain about anything? Huh? Come on. Huh? All right. So David here is complaining about something. What is he complaining about? Well, let's read on. The Bible here says, I, show, I complained before him. I showed before him my troubles. We've all experienced those things. When my spirit was overwhelmed. Boy, I'll tell you, he knew what it was to be overwhelmed. Do you? You've ever experienced that type of scenario in your own personal life? He was overwhelmed by everything that was happening at that particular time. And within me, then thou knowest my path, in the way wherein I walk, have they privately, privately laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand, and behold, there was no man there that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared. For my soul, 
I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion. In the land of the living, attend unto my cry. For I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall come past me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. Our Heavenly Father, as we look at this passage of Scripture, it seems as if though that in some way, in some portions, we probably have all sung this song. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe there's not a person here today that doesn't know what it's like to be overwhelmed by certain situations that they are faced with in their life. And dear God, there may be some today that are just at that brink of just beginning to shriek out, dear God, and to come before you, dear Heavenly Father, and even lay out their complaints, dear Heavenly Father. Lord, there's some here today that are at a breaking point. There's some here today, dear Heavenly Father, that are so heavily laden and burdened. There's some here today, dear Heavenly Father, that are at the very prefaces of dear Heavenly Father going over possibly the edge. And we're praying that, dear God, today through your wonderful message and through the encouragement that David found when he come before you and began to cry out unto you, that, dear Heavenly Father, there's great hope and don't give up. And, dear Heavenly Father, sooner or later things are going to work out. For these things we're asking in Jesus' name, amen and amen. When I look in verse number four here, I see that David really gives the reason for this whole song. Now remember, David has a legitimate reason for being in the physical, mental, and spiritual state that he is in at this time. He's been on the run for quite some time. And he's finding himself here at this particular time in a dark, damp, cave which literally at one point Saul himself will come and Saul will spend the night there and David will be given an opportunity there he could have killed Saul but he did not but David's in this cave and here he is at a point that he is about to go under he has a legitimate reason about this and this is such a moment in David's life that literally David will write eight different songs eight different psalms in this period of time in his life and do you realize that a lot of songs are written when people are going through a difficult time do you realize that a song can be an uplifting thing a moment of encouragement and here david is going through all these things and he brings his complaint before the lord and he lets the lord know how he feels he was being honest with god and you know what we might as well be honest with god because god knows us anyway right and David here was being very honest with God, and he was letting God know that this was really a burden on him. He was letting God know this was really painful to him. And God could tell that it was really bothering David by just the approach to the throne of God through prayer. As he began to shriek out unto God with his voice, he was crying out and asking for God to come on the scene and to help him in a very special way. Being overwhelmed, what does that mean? Being overwhelmed literally means that he is carrying a very heavy load at this time. Maybe you are carrying a very heavy load right now. With all that's going on in this world today, it's easy to become overwhelmed, isn't it? I mean, really and truly, there's a lot of negativism going around on about every aspect. Well, I'm here today to ask you to look up. I'm here today to encourage you. Just like David was saying in the very last verse there in number seven, bring my soul out of prison. How many of you like to be delivered today? How many of you would like to get out of that bondage and, and get rid of that burden that you've been carrying around for the last little while? That I might praise thy name, the righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. So David here is overwhelmed in this passage of scripture. He's literally at the end of his road. He's got about as much on him as he can bear. He can't take no more. That's where David is in this passage of Scripture. And we find out here that as David is wondering and what he is going about and all these things that were happening to him, that he was so overwhelmed. So what does David do about his circumstance? What do you do when you find yourself just overwhelmed? 
When you find yourself so burdened that you cannot carry the load that's been placed on your shoulders. When you find yourself so depressed that you can't even get out of bed and you don't even want to take a step. You don't even know that uh, you're going to make it through the day or not. What did David do when he found himself in that state of mind? What did David do when he found himself so overwhelmed? Well, he cried out. Now, friends, isn't it good that we've got somebody that we can cry out to? Don't we all need somebody to cry out to? Isn't it good to know that at certain times of our lives when we're facing certain situations that we've got somebody that cares about us, somebody that cares about us, somebody's got that overwhelming, never-ending love for us that we can come to? That's what David does. He goes and he cries out. He cries out with his own voice. He brings his supplications before the Lord. He shows God the troubles that he's going through at that particular time. He's telling them about how that the enemy is after him, how that the enemy is setting traps for him, how that this is troubling him in such a tremendous way. And the one thing that really was troubling David was that the Bible here literally says that David looks to his right and there's nobody there to help him. David is at the place right now in his life where it seems as if though nobody cares. David feels like at this moment that he is all alone in this world. And that he is going through all of this all by himself. And he feels as if though nobody cares about him anymore. I wonder where his brothers were at this time, his father. I wonder where that crowd was when David went out and faced Goliath and he come back victorious. I wonder where all those people that knowed how good a warrior David was before Saul got so jealous of him and they were not around. And David says, I looked around me and there was nobody there. Nobody cared for my soul. How much do we care for the souls of other people? First of all, I want us to address that thought. How much do you care about other people? How much do you care about lost people? People that if they were to die today, they'd wind up in hell. People that you might know. They might be one of your closest friends. They may be your family member. Could be a brother. Could be a sister. Could be a spouse. It could be a child. It could be a grandchild. How much do you care for their souls? Not only the souls of those that are lost, but how much do you care for those that are saved? How many times, and I'm curious about this, that in the last 10 years has anybody ever come by outside the walls of the church and asked you about, are you saved or not? How many people have been so concerned about your soul that they would come to you and say, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Are you ready to go to heaven through faith in the only begotten Son of God? How many times have you been approached about that? So how many people do you think in this world really cares about the lost? How many people do you think really cares about your soul in this world in which we are living in. I tell you though, I bet you could tell me that the Jehovah Witnesses have come around. And I bet you've seen the Mormons going around in their, uh, uh, their uh, attempts to uh, get people to come into their way of believing and things of that nature. But where is the church at today? Where is the evangelistic arm of Bible-believing Christian people? Do we not care for the souls of lost people anymore? Are we just giving up on them? Here I got some startling statistics for you, and I know these are very alarming. They have alarmed me. Do you know that there were 9,000 Southern Baptist churches last year that did not baptize one soul? 9,000 Southern Baptist churches last year, 2019, that did not baptize one soul. I went and done some calculations on that. That's about 9,000 times, uh, if you stop and you think about it, 52 weeks, three services a week, and so forth like that. 
There's 9,000 churches that didn't baptize a soul. If they had three services a, a week times 52 weeks, how many hours do you think that the Word of God was being presented in those 9,000 churches three times a week, 52 weeks in a year? 1,404,000 hours were spent not one soul was saved. Now, doesn't that alarm us, or do we not care? Do we not care about the souls of lost people anymore? I think we're seeing the results of how much we care about lost people by what's going on in the world today. I think we're seeing the results of people that have fallen away from the church itself, and nobody's reaching out to them about their salvation. Wouldn't it be wonderful if a lot of these folks that are out here causing a lot of this turmoil get saved? Paul was one who started turmoil when he was called Saul, but God saved him. Well, think about the statistics here. The average church, now the average church has an attendance of 75 people out of all the Southern Baptist churches. The average church has 75 in attendance. So that's 75 people times 9,000 churches. You know how many people that comes up with? Who, who got that? 675,000 people. On an average, meet together three times a week or once a week. That's, six, uh, that's 675,000 people that didn't lead a soul to the Lord. Do we really care about people's souls? Because... Sometimes it's not so much that we really didn't get to lead somebody to the Lord. What's really ashamed is we didn't even try. We didn't even try. That's what's shameful. We're going to be held accountable for at least trying. Now, if we go out and witness to somebody and they reject Jesus Christ, then it's on them. But if we don't go out and try to tell people about Jesus Christ, then their blood's going to be on our hands. You think that's going to be a wonderful day when you stand before the Lord? And when the Lord says, why didn't you tell your brother about me? Do you think that's going to be a wonderful day when we stand before the Lord and he asks us, why didn't you talk to your best friend about how much I loved him and died on the cross for him and was willing to save his soul just like I saved your soul. What are you going to say to the Lord that day? What are you going to say to the Lord when you're at the great white throne judgment? You're saved. Your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. But here comes your child. Here comes your grandchild standing before God. They're lost. They've never been saved. They're standing there before God. And they are taken and bound and cast into the lake of fire. And there we are on the sidelines. What do you think we're going to say then? Do we not care about the souls of those that are lost? Do we not care about people that we love going to heaven with us? Do we not want them to go to heaven with us? Are we not concerned like we should be? David said, I looked around. There's nobody there. Nobody cared about my soul. Nobody cared about my soul. Friends, I went to church every Sunday when I was growing up. My uncle made sure that we were in church every Sunday. And while we was in church, I hated it and I despised it. I didn't want to be there. But I want to tell you something, that when I got out of church and I left church and didn't want to ever go back to church again, there come a time when God brought a convicting power upon me and I know that I was lost. But I want to tell you something. I want you to know, I didn't even know how to be saved. I'd been in church all them years. I could tell you about David and Goliath. I, I, I could tell you about crossing the Red Sea. I, I could tell you about the manna from heaven. and I could tell you a lot about the Bible because I come up through church all them years until the point I finally just left home and I left church and I didn't ever want to go back to church again. I could tell you a lot of things about the Bible, but I could, could not tell you the most important thing is, and that's how to be saved. Now, isn't it a shame that people who have a head knowledge of the Bible have no heart understanding or acceptance of Jesus Christ? Well, I don't want that ever to be said about Altamaha Hall Baptist Church as long as I'm here. And you might be getting tired of me telling you the gospel story, but I'm going to keep telling you the gospel story as long as I'm here. 
Because I don't want not one person to one day wind up in a place of being under conviction and saying, I don't know how to be saved because I've never heard how. I want you to know that I care about your soul. And I know that there's 9,000 churches, three services each, uh, each day, 52 weeks out of the year. That's 1,440,000 ,040 hours of church service that no one was saved. The average church has 75 in attendance. That's 75 times 9,000. That's 675,000 people that didn't lead a soul to the Lord. How many people have you tried to lead to Jesus this year? There was 1,404,000 invitations given, possibly given, where nobody responded for salvation in those churches. And why was it that maybe nobody responded? Maybe it's because the gospel wasn't being presented. Maybe it was because that average of 75 people in each church didn't even go out and try to tell anybody or bring anybody in that needed to be saved. Churches today, right now, only about 15% of the churches are growing. 15% of the churches are growing. That's 85% of the churches are dying. You understand that? 85% of the churches are dying. Do you know what that's going to calculate in over the next couple of years? That's going to calculate in the, one, in the horrible fact that thousands and thousands and thousands of churches are going to close their doors. Only about 15% of the churches today are growing, but out of those 15% that are growing, only 2.2% of those that are growing are growing from conversions. Most of the churches that are growing, those 22% are growing because people are coming in from other churches that are not possibly getting fed where they were at and so forth like that. And they're coming in from other churches, but really who are the ones that are really uh, getting led to? Only 2.2% of the churches are really uh, having that done. So after thinking and reading about this, I am reminded what David says there in the book of Psalms, chapter 142, and verse number 4, does anyone care for my soul? He felt all alone there. You can be in a crowd like this one right here this morning, and you could be sitting there, but yet be all alone. You could be in the midst of a multitude of people in a stadium filled with people, but yet you could be there in a state of being alone all by yourself. But people need to know that truly there is somebody that cares for you. Isn't that encouraging to know that somebody will care for you? Isn't it wonderful to know that you can call upon somebody any moment of any day or night that loves you so much, that was willing to sacrifice his life on your behalf? Isn't it good to know? I want to tell you right now that you can rest assured that if you are lost or if you are saved, God cares for you. You all write that down. God cares for you. He cares for you that are lost and he cares for you that are saved. We can quote the verse of scripture, John 3, 16, and I hope everybody here knows that at least by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, that's a caring God. That's a caring God who was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son so that our sins could be paid for in a horrible, harsh, terrible way on a cross of crucifixion. Friends, aren't you glad that God cares for you? I'm glad that God cared for me. And I'm glad that God cared for me so much that he come looking for me. I wasn't looking for him. But God loves you and God loves me and God wants us to come to heaven. And God was willing to make a way so that that could be done. And there was only one way that a supreme sacrifice had to be made. Not just any sacrifice would have been substantial enough for my sins to be forgiven, nor your sins to be forgiven. It had to be an ultimate sacrifice. It had to be a sacrifice far greater and above anything that could have ever been done. And the only one that could have done that was God's Son. God's Son gave himself. He cares for you. 
God let his son come to this world. That's how much God cares for you. Friends, I've told you before and I'll tell you again. I wouldn't give my children to, for any of you. I'm just being honest with you. I love you. And if I could help you, I'd try to help you. If your house was on fire and I come down the road here this morning, I seen your house was on fire and I know that you were in there. Maybe you hadn't got up. It's Sunday morning. It's your only morning to sleep in. And I come by your house. I know you don't get up to the last minute because you come in the house of church at the very last minute. So I figure you in that house asleep. I would like to think, you know, you don't know what you do to your face with the moment, but I'd like to think that I would stop the car, get out and go in there and say, you're going to be late for church. <laughs> but that wouldn't be the supreme sacrifice if I didn't come out. Because if Mark would have been riding with me or if Olivia would have been riding with me, we seen your house on fire. If I would have jumped out and come in there and try to get you out of there the best I could, I'm not trying to brag about myself. I'm saying, you know, I would like to think that's what I'd do. I really think that's what I would do. But if Olivia tried to run into that house, I'd tackle her. You parents know what I'm talking about right now, don't you? If my son would try to run in that house, I'd try to block him. I'd sacrifice myself, but I wouldn't want to sacrifice my children. And I'm telling you right now, the supreme sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, would have been what God did because that would have affected my heart more than it would have affected my heart if I would have come in there and done it. I often wondered when I was lost, and I often wondered as a young Christian, God, why did you send your son? God, why didn't you come yourself? And it finally dawned on me, basically after I had children of my own, that the greatest of all sacrifices would have been my child and not myself. What a high price. You don't think God cares for you? When you get in that moment and we all been there, right? What did the disciples say unto Jesus when they was in the midst of that storm? Carest thou not that we... You ever complain to God about anything? What did Jesus even say there on the cross when he was on the cross? My God, my God. Why? What church? When we get into those moments like that and we've all been there, right? I want you to stop right then and look at Calvary. And you're going to see real quickly how much God cares for you. And if God cares enough for you to give the greatest sacrifice that he could have ever uh, given, he cares enough for you to supply your needs, to take care of you, to look after us. God cares for you. And I know we get down, and I know we go through troubles, and I know we get overwhelmed. And I know sometimes it seems like we're in this thing all by ourselves, just like Isaiah, Elijah said that, that one time. But friends, I want to tell you something. God cares for you. God really cares for you in such a remarkable way. God really does care for you. Matter of fact, throughout the Bible, God calls people about 1,900 times. Go back in the very first pages of the Bible, you'll find out God really is interested in you. What did he say to Adam after Adam had sinned? God came looking for him. I like that song, 99, who'd he leave? He went and go... He went to get him, right? He came down here. He was looking for Adam and Eve. What did he say? What did he say? Wherefore art thou? Maybe right now God's looking for you. And maybe God's calling you. 
where you been? Where are you at now? You know what? God knows where you are. God knew where Adam was, didn't he? God was just wanting Adam to acknowledge. I'm trying to hide from God. You ever tried hiding from God? Kind of crazy, ain't it? Kind of crazy. But we can read in our Bibles and we can see in many different passages like in the book of Titus chapter 2 verse number 11 God calls all man to be saved he wants everybody to be saved I've often been asked what about people down in uh, Africa and people over in Iraq and people in China and different places like that does God care about them he sure does well they can't get the word over there and it's against the law to preach the gospel and a lot of these things and this that and another how are they going to get saved listen to what God says for the grace of God, what's the grace of God? The unmerited love. God loves everybody, right? For the grace of God that bringeth what church? Bringeth what salvation? Hath what church? Appeared to who church? What does the Bible there say? All men. How does God do that? How does God's Spirit appear to all men all over the world? How does that happen? Look at Psalms chapter 19, verse number 1. Look at what the Bible here says. How could anybody deny that there's a God? How could anybody conceive in their mind, unless they're absolutely blinded as they can be, how is it that the natural man can't even discern something about the Spirit because the Bible here clearly says that the heavens declare the glory of God. Go outside and look at that sun 89 million miles away. And that sun's been burning for all these years at exactly the right type of temperature that we've been able to sustain life here for thousands of years. Man, that's my God. There has to be a master architect, a master engineer. A master of the universe. There had to be somebody that put everything together as we are experiencing in our very lives right now. There is no way in the world that it just happened like the, like the people want you to believe. It wasn't just an explosion. It was God in his mastermind miraculous ability that says, I want this. That's my God. And for everybody, wherever they are, God cares for their soul. And even though they might not have the Word of God there, friends, all they got to do is look around and realize, man, there's got to be a God. And then the Spirit, don't underestimate the ministry of the Spirit of God, because if it wouldn't have been for the Spirit of God, you wouldn't have gotten saved. I knew what the Bible said. I knew what the Bible said about Moses, and, and I know what the Bible says about crossing the Red Sea. I know what the Bible says about the walls of Jericho coming down. But if it wouldn't have been for the Holy Spirit of God coming and bringing conviction upon my heart, I would have never gotten saved. I would have had a head knowledge, but my heart would have still been far from him. Friend, I would have had a form of godliness, but I would have denied the power of God to wash away my sins and save my soul. Woo! Well, if I could sing, I'd sing a song right now. I'll fly away. I'm telling you the truth. I, I love it. Look at the Bible here again in Romans chapter 1, verse number 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Scientists are still finding things today that proves that there's a God. They might not admit it. They don't want to own up to it, but scientists today are still discovering that, my goodness, this could not have just happened. The theory, the theory, the theory. You understand what a theory is, right? I, right? The theory, it means it's a thought, it's not a proving fact. The theory of evolution, it's a theory, it's a theory of man, it's a theory that has come along from Satan. The theory of evolution. Boy, I'm telling you right now, 
the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Friends, we are made up of so many integral parts. I'm telling you, it, it boggles my mind sometimes just to think the human, the human itself, the ability to see, to hear, to taste, to speak, and, and, and to move around, and, and all the veins in our body and the heart that God puts in our chest that automatically beats us the greatest pump in the world and it just constantly I don't have to say beat 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 I it just it just does it even when I'm asleep you know I mean goodness gracious I got an eye that's better than any lens that any man has ever invented I've got ears that can hear that are better than any type of technology that has come along God's given me a mind as far superior to any computer that has ever been invented Woo! and like a computer I don't know how to use my mind either Clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So that what church, what church? Nobody has an excuse. There is not one soul in hell right now that can come up with a legitimate excuse as to why they wound up there. And I know, and the time is about gone, but I want you to realize that there's this old saying going around here and it's leading people to hell really, truly. God is so loving, he's not going to send nobody to hell. How many times have you ever heard that? God is so loving, he's not going to send. I'm going to tell you, there is nobody that loves us like God. His love is everlasting, right? Everlasting. His love, I mean, just wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. But I want to tell you right now, it ain't God sending you to hell. You're choosing to go there. You're choosing to ignore God. You're choosing to ignore salvation. You think you can do it on your own. You think you can be good enough. You think you're not as bad as somebody else. You think you can believe in some man-made doctrine concerning, well, if I get baptized or if I take communion or if I join the church, all these, all these all these things that man has devised and come up with that's trying as misleading people and so forth like that. Friend, there is nothing that can wash away your sins but the blood of Jesus Christ. There is nobody that can save you. Even Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life and no man coming to the Father but by me. So nobody will have an excuse. <laughs> Nobody has an excuse that is there. Friends, I'm telling you right now, you're not some tiny little speck in a universe lost and nobody knows where you're at. I'm telling you, I've got a God that cares about me so much, he knows my name. Some of you don't even know the name of the person sitting beside you right now. Huh? Is there anybody in here that don't know the name of the person sitting beside them right now? Okay. Yeah. I, I, was, I was thinking about that, Cliff. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I know. But God knows you by name. God is so interested in your life, and I know I'm going to get it. He even knows how many hairs you got on your head. <laughs> See, I told you. <laughs> God is so interested in us that he can tell us that even if a bird falls from the sky, from his place there in heaven, he knows it. God cares about you. So when we get to that place where David was and we feel so overwhelmed and we feel like nobody really cares about us, I want you to know God cares about you. Oh, we could go on and on and on today, and I'd love to be able to do so, but we could go on and on today. I want to tell you what, Jesus cares about you. Jesus cares not only about your soul, he wants to save your soul, and we've gone through that already. But I want to tell you something, that Jesus cares so much about you, that even when you are saved, he is asking you to come to him with your problems and your troubles. Even the Bible itself tells us he cares for us. God cares for you. It doesn't matter how dark it's going to get out here in this world. We've already been warned. We should have seen this coming. We shouldn't have been caught by surprise. 
The Bible says things are going to wax worse and worse, but for the child of God, it's just a sign to us that you just be looking up and keep your ears open because there could be a trump from God being sounded any second. There could be this wonderful voice, shout from glory that could be radiating through every ear of every person that is saved, and we could take off out of this world. The Lord cares for you. Jesus cared for you. Friend, God didn't have to force him to come. He came. He could have got off of that cross, but he didn't. He knew I was coming. He knew you were coming. He knew you would have to be saved. He knew I'd have to be saved, and there was only one way. That's for him to sacrifice himself. Not only does Jesus care about your soul, but he also cares about your well-being while you're here on earth. He wants to be with you. The Holy Spirit cares about you. See, see, we get that pity part. I've been there, right? Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Huh? Gloom, despair, and agony on me. That's why they don't let me sing no specials. But the Holy Spirit cares about you. Jesus cares about you. God the Father cares about you. I'm going to tell you something kind of astonishing. There's people that you know of that are in hell. And I think I'm pretty safe in saying this, that probably we all have an acquaintance of somebody somewhere that's in hell. I mean, it's very likely. I'm going to tell you something. Not everybody I have held a funeral for, for is in heaven. But it's very possible, very possible that we all know of somebody that's in hell. And they might have had you fooled, and you might not think they're there, but come to great white throne judgment, you're going to find out you, you didn't make it. But you was a good, you, I'm not going to go into that sermon, that's a different sermon. But what the point I want to make is this, there's some people in hell that care enough about you that they don't want you coming there. That's kind of astonishing, right? Because you remember when Lazarus died and that rich man died? In the Bible. You know what the rich man finally got around to doing? He finally got around to asking Abraham to send somebody to tell his brothers. I believe that there's probably some people in hell that care enough about us to say, I don't want you here. Because I'm telling you right now, it ain't no party even going on there. You want to talk about a place being alone? You'll be alone in hell, but the place will be full. Hell's enlarging itself. Churches are dying. 9,000 Baptist churches didn't even have one conversion. And hell keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But there's people in hell who know you and me. I don't want them here. I don't want them here. But there's also people in heaven that care about you. That passage of scripture that y'all are singing about is really in there because the Lord is, they're speaking about right there in that passage of scripture. He says that there's rejoicing in heaven over one that repents. And then it goes on to say in verse number 10 of that same passage of scripture, it says, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. It didn't just mean, first thing, if you read that one verse, you could have, you could have, you could have thought, well, well, the angels. But when you read that verse number 10 after that, it says, in the presence of the angels. And that literally is saying to us that there must be somebody else up there praising God and rejoicing. And the angels are watching. In the presence of the angels. Who is that up there that want to hear that you got saved? Somebody that before you. 
Could be your grandmother, grandpa, mom, your dad. Could be your brother, sister. Could be even one of your children. I mean, your children. Oh, I hope mama makes it. I hope daddy makes it. And can you imagine, can you imagine what it would be like when your name's called out up there in heaven? Can you imagine? It says there's rejoicing over one sinner that repents in the presence of the angels. And boy, I think about 42 years ago, that lady that first took me in and died of cancer when I was about four and a half years old, when my name's Steve Tucker, Steve Tucker, goodness gracious, I believe Vi was a shouting in glory. She took me in and tried to raise me for a while. And boy, I was a little old boy that she took in and got saved, I got saved. Or don't you think they care? Don't you think there's people in heaven want you to get saved and want you to come to heaven? You better believe it. You better believe it. Let's stand to our feet. Maybe there's some here today, maybe you're listening to me by way of the internet as well, and you feel like David did here in Psalms 142. You're just overwhelmed. So much is happening. People are after you. Traps have been set for you. Things are not going at all easy for you. Maybe you've just gotten a terrible doctor's report. Maybe you've just got news your job's going to be terminated. Maybe you're having some family problems. Maybe your children are just going on in such a wrong direction. And you're just overwhelmed. There's so many things that could just overwhelm us, and we've all been there. We, we all know what it's like to be overwhelmed. We all know what it's like to battle some level of depression. We know what it's like to be brought to the very edge of uh, not being able to take no more. We've had all we can stand. We're at the very, very last thread of the rope that we're holding on, and it's about to break. And, We've all know what it's like to really start crying out, crying out, crying out to God. In a moment of desperation. And you're in that state right now. And why don't you come and cry out to God? That's what David did. Read how many times the Bible there says in Psalms 142 that he cried unto the Lord. Cried unto the Lord. He spoke to God. He poured his heart out to God. He even complained. He let God know how he felt, but he also knew that God had a solution. Read the last verse. Don't never read Psalms 142 without reading the last verse. God is going to do the same for you. His ears open until your cry. If you're here today and poor things just ain't going easy, you just don't know how much more you can take. You don't know how much more you can stand. I tell you, this whole world is just enough to overwhelm you. The way things are going is just enough to depress you. If you need to come this morning, why don't you come? Why don't you come? Maybe you're here today and you've never been saved. You've never been washed in the blood, you've never, never experienced that wonderful thing called born again. Your life has never changed. You've never been given that second chance of having a renewed life in Christ. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Accept the greatest sacrifice. God cares for you. His Son cares for you. The Holy Spirit cares for you. People in heaven care for you. People in hell don't want you coming there. So why don't you come? If you wind up in hell, it won't be God's fault. If you wind up in hell, it's the choice that you've made. And you'll be there forever. And forever. Why take that chance? Why don't you come? Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, I need my soul to be saved. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Lord Jesus, save, save my soul. Lord, come into my life. Take control. Maybe you need to do that right now. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Do you care for others? Do you care for others? 
If somebody needs help, would you be there for them? Would you be able to help them? Are you trying to reach other people? Are you trying to tell other people about Jesus Christ? Do you want this church to become a church that in the statistics it will say eventually one day that, well, not one soul was saved there that last year? Do you want this to be that kind of church that's going to die? There's going to be thousands of churches that will close their doors this year, not just because of the pandemic and all that goes along with that, but they're going to be closing their doors because ain't nobody coming no more because they hadn't been evangelizing anybody. And we shouldn't just be concerned about the church's existence as far as that's concerned. We ought to be more concerned about their eternal state. Be concerned about their salvation. Is anybody that needs to come? Bless your hearts for coming today. Continue to be much in prayer one for another. And uh, let's uh, go out and be a great light into this world. Remember Anita's dad, too, in prayer. They're waiting for some results to come in from some testing, but he's not having a very easy time. I meant to tell everybody that Jim Hall has been brought home, but hospice has been called in. So pray for June and Jim Hall in a very special way as well. And just again, there's so many that we really, really want to keep praying for. But let's be dismissed in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for caring for us. I want to thank you for your Son, Jesus, and your Holy Spirit. And Heavenly Father, I pray you'll continue now to go with us and guide us and lead us, dear God, and give us a boldness, dear Heavenly Father. And Lord, empower us, dear God, to lift up Jesus Christ before every person that we come in contact with. For these things we ask are in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you for being here today. Amen.